Okay, at this point, we are going to bring up our three speakers from the morning. And uh, joining them will be uh, Dr. Ben Danielson. Um, and uh, we've asked uh, Dr. Danielson to join this group because of his work uh, at Seattle Children's, where he's now been for about 16 years. Um, ben is the director of the medical director of the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic uh, in Seattle, and he holds the Jim and Janet Senegal Endowed Chair for the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. Um, the clinic uh, is located in the Central District of Seattle and has been a very active part of Seattle's that uh, multi-ethnic area of the city. Um, and it largely serves a group of disadvantaged children. Uh, and so before we open it up for questions, I've just asked uh, Dr. Danielson if he um, uh, would like to respond to the three speakers this morning to take a few minutes to do so. Thank you, and good morning. Don't ever ask me if I want to say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> I've become a very verbose in my, in my years. But um, I work in a clinic that's an amazing place to work, and we serve an incredible population, mostly low income and mostly living in South Seattle and South King County. I was really moved and struck by the range and the breadth of commentary from uh, these great speakers today. Um, and it really struck a chord with the work that I have the privilege of doing among some really great people in the clinic. Um, I was really thinking about uh, Dr. Catherine Mosley's uh, comments and uh, the idea that stress is an arbiter and a conduit of ill health. And also thinking about the personal effects. And uh, every time I see that black baby doll uh, video, it just uh, blows me away. And it's uh, such a cause for, for pause and for thought and for reconsideration. I'm always impressed by the words of Dr. Steven Brzezuchka. Um, even if I don't pronounce his name perfectly every time I say it. <laughs> he talks so well about the poor system that we have, and it's poor performance in this country, in, especially in terms of um, um, appropriate care across societal spectrums, not just for poor, not just for communities of color, and that income gaps really determine population health, as seen so eloquently in the spirit level. Also that our health care system does not, at least the way we have it structured today, does not determine our health to any significant degree. This is humbling when you spend a bunch of years training to be a healthcare worker. I think about the metagenerational uh, aspects that he pulled into the conversation, and I will pause and say I worry a little bit when I hear someone say, um, with possibly overstating the role of slavery in today's health issues, and I want to think about that a little bit more. I was very touched by uh, Erica Blackshirt's comments as well. Um, I think there's an appropriate level of complexity that she adds to this discourse um, and these ideas of redistribution and recognition, the idea of isms and how we approach those, and the idea that redistribution can actually reinforce stigmatizing isms is really important to think about. The concept uh, that I will steal from her and repeat in the future, that equity cannot be achieved without addressing both systematic policy and parental capacity is something that's really important and something I feel like I see every single day in the clinic. And moreover, the importance of talking to families and listening to families. I love working in uh, the clinic and it's such an interesting thing to be here in the Seattle area because um, you've probably seen these recent uh, um, population statistics about how Seattle itself is the fifth whitest um, city in the country. But South King County is actually the most diverse uh, community in the country. And uh, the socioeconomic patterns are also similarly both blinding and elucidating, depending on where you choose to look in this uh, area. I work with um, kids from many different cultural backgrounds, but most of them are low income. And I see the effect of stress every single day on the families that I work with. And I see that directly on the kids we work with in terms of the rates of obesity and asthma and diabetes and just about every other chronic disease and complex medical disease that you can think about. I also see the effect across generations, and it breaks my heart to see the rates of kids who are growing up without a parent, without both parents directly, without uh, the wisdom of grandparents and aunts and uncles, and the effect that stress has across the family structure, 
is really incredible to me. I think about uh, the daily trickle of stress, and I think that's really important because not only is it important in Dr. Brzezuszka's mention about things like 9-11, uh, when the direct effect of stress on ground zero people really affected things like low birth weight and prematurity and infant mortality. But I think it's also interesting to look at um, like a study from California in March of 2002 that showed that Arab American women suddenly had increasing rates of low birth weight and prematurity and infant mortality. The change in social status of a population from one without a significant uh, level of social stigmata necessarily to one where the social stigmata was focused after 9-11 had a direct effect on pregnancies across, across the continent. And I think that's an important piece about the steady effects of stress societally, not just the acute and sort of um, circumferential effects of stress within a certain uh, geographic area. It also reminds me that stress is a trickle and not a tidal wave necessarily. We've seen these statistics before as well, and I think I've heard you speak about the ways in which um, the infant mortality uh, based on race and socioeconomic is affected such that a woman who is college educated, who has an advanced degree, who is working in this field, or maybe a lawyer, or maybe another professional, who is African American, has a higher infant mortality rate for her child than a Caucasian woman who had not finished high school. The daily trickle of stress is important, and I could not think of it more clearly than when I heard a grandmother the other day say, both of my boys, and they were her boys because she had to raise them, both my boys have hypertension. No surprise to me considering what they go through every day. And she was channeling a very important Russian playwright named Anton Chekhov, who said once that anybody can endure a big crisis. It's this day-to-day -day crap that wears you out. He might not have said crap. <laughs> But it reminds me, for pediatric primary care, you have to be involved in the social determinants of health. You have to be involved in the social determinants of health, and pediatric care has to be trusted in order to be effective. That social determinants can work in many different ways across many different spectrums. In our clinic, we do things like give away books with each visit because we truly believe that you can't educate an unhealthy child and you can't keep an uneducated child healthy. We do things like have a lawyer as a medical legal partnership come into our clinic because we sorely believe that when you affect the social determinants through civil legal intervention, you have a greater effect on health care than anything I could do writing a prescription. We pr do programs like promoting first relationships because we sorely believe, we truly believe that getting into a home and helping a mom identify her strengths early on in her role as a parent is going to have a huge effect on that child's well-being moving down the road. These things are important. And the last thing I'll say is that it makes me wonder a little bit about how healthcare reform as we have it designed today is really going to address a lot of the issues that I see in the clinic. And it makes me worry about certain things. Like, I'll throw one thing out there quickly. Like, if we have a healthcare system that reimburses you based on your performance, how will you take into account the meta generational effects? How will you take into account the social determinants that are around the families that we serve every single day? Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Danielson. So we have a few minutes for questions or comments for the panelists. So if you can come up to the mics on either side with those, we will entertain them. Anybody? Yeah. Um, my name is Lauren Hunter. I'm a medical school applicant and um, I know that um, Dr. Danielson, you spoke of some practical programs that you see implemented in the communities to address a lot of these disparities and having seen these disparities um, in multiple areas in hospital setting, mental health, um, clinical, primary care settings. Um, I'm wondering if each of you can speak to um, something that I've struggled with right now, which is in possibly enter in, in likely entering this profession, I find that it's challenging to 
have this knowledge of these realities and I become frustrated and I want to change things, but I feel that the easiest way for me to implement those changes is to just be the change. And I'm wondering if each of you could speak to how in your own practices, um, what programs, what initiatives, what um, policies you work with that you've seen positively impact and address these disparities. Well, congratulations on applying to medical school, brave woman. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there are a number of ways to address this. I mean, not all of us can be the giant policy makers to affect the broad and sweeping changes that would, for example, institute some kind of universal health care, et cetera. But all of us, you know, have to use the analogy of the guy with the starfish on the beach where there's all these beach starfish and he's throwing them back one by one and somebody comes up and goes, well, how can you make a difference? There's, there's thousands of them on the beach, and he keeps throwing them back, and he goes, yeah, but it made a difference to that one. So, for example, when you see a patient, you can address the issues. You can be an advocate in your own clinic, for example, for non-traditional hours. It has helped in our clinic, and we just, again, we're just primary care, but the fact that parents can bring them their child in at six o'clock after they've picked them up from daycare and they've got a fever instead of either having to wait or go to urgent care or God forbid, take time off. Um, advocating for more social services within your clinic, becoming familiar with what's available to you in the neighborhood in terms of social services, support services, because a lot of the families even though they live in that community, aren't aware of what's available to them. So at every level, you can do something, and it makes a difference to someone. And you know, there will always be somebody up there who is able to affect global change. But if all of us do the little bit that we can, we all move us forward, I hope, to, God forbid I say this, a better day. <laughs> I'd just say really quickly, especially responding to somebody who is going to be a wonderful doctor uh, very soon, that uh, the importance of training is an incredible piece of, um, of uh, expanding the potential for better delivery of healthcare in the future. I think that every bit of training, whether it's medical school or nursing school or any of the um, healthcare professions should include a strong training in activism. I think we should be activists. We should be pediatric activists. Well, I'm the only non-physician up here, so I don't have immediate access to the, the, the populations that you all do, but um, I am a citizen, and I vote, and I talk to people, well, I talk to just about anybody who'll let me speak to them, and you know, my students, of course, they have to listen to me, but uh, if I'm in an elevator and somebody asks me, what I do, I, I tell them about what I do, and I quickly tell them about social inequalities in health, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and they often get off earlier than I think they actually had to. Um, so I want to just say one thing about your frustration. Uh, I've spent much of my life frustrated, and I, I think it's probably propelled me through life. I worry about the day when I wake up and I'm not frustrated. Um, so, you know, embrace the frustration and become a great doctor and do everything these really smart people tell you to do. As I think about uh, principles for guiding action, I think, what do, you, what do you have skills at? What do you enjoy doing? And what can you do for a long period of time without being paid to do? So, uh, you know, we all, we all have skills and, and things that we enjoy doing, and if we can combine those two and not look for revenue to support doing that, that's a good idea. So, uh, for example, I, I would sometimes talk about these ideas with patients in the ER. Not during a code, typically, but, <laughs> but for example, I had some, some people come back and they would say, hey, I, I want to talk more about some of these ideas, and I'd say, you know, how did this happen? Well, I was at some, you know, I was here before and you mentioned something and 
here they are again. So patients can be receptive to these ideas. And get out into the community. We all, you know, in, in my courses, I make the students have to take the ideas in the course and, and present them to a community event that they organize. So, you know, every, we all have communities in which we can discuss these ideas. And you have to find language to frame them that doesn't turn people off. I find that really difficult. Certain communities are, are, are kind of easy. Tomorrow, I'm going to be uh, at a Unitarian Universalist congregation talking about these ideas, because they're about the only religious group that will listen to me. But, <laughs> and, and they do it repeatedly. So I, I think we need those kinds of opportunities. So what do you enjoy? What do you have skills at? And what can you keep doing for a long time? Thank you. Doug. Uh, Doug Opel from Seattle Children's. I have a number of observations that sort of dovetail the last comment. Um, the first w is, I feel like I was much more hopeful about real change maybe five years ago. I had just received my MPH, had seen a lot of the facts for the first time that you, Stephen, sort of presented, and I was blown away at that time about just how dramatic they are. And, because we were the worst at everything, how, could not, how, how, could, how couldn't the people in charge realize that, see those numbers, and make a change? And you know, Obama was about to be president, et cetera, et cetera. And five years have passed, and we've had some change, but it hasn't had the effect that just with the facts alone, I thought would have been easy to make, which makes me think, as I've done work in other things, like parents refusing immunizations, the facts aren't all what matters to people. There are values, beliefs, cultural worldviews that if things don't fit the way you want to look at them, you tend to ignore them. So what, and you sort of alluded to this a little bit, what, what beyond the facts? I mean, we can, in, we can inform and educate as much as we want, but I fear that that's not going to be enough for real change. What beyond that can we do to get past these cultural worldviews. And to Ben, I liked your comment, we should all be pediatric activists. Some medical schools around the country are integrating MPH curriculums into their medical school curriculum. You get an MPH essentially by becoming a doctor. Why don't we do more of that? And can you comment on that? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I remember Oscar Wilde said, don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. And, <laughs> And so that's a real problem. I, I presented a lot of facts. Uh, um, that maybe works for this kind, of an, this kind of a group, but for other people, stories matter. And I think right now, we're in the midst of a scientific revolution in thinking about health. And I think it's been going on for probably 30 years. And like any scientific revolution, when you're in it, you're very confused. You don't know what's going on. Other countries have understood what produces health. Australia has suggested uh, uh, there's actually a government uh, uh, goal to make Australia the healthiest country in the world. It's third behind Japan right now. And they want to become the healthiest by 2020. So they've let a, uh, put out a bunch of strategies to accomplish that. That's part of this scientific revolution. And we're very confused in this country as it's going on. And we'll have to sort of. Uh, look back at the history books and how they re record this particular period of time. So um, I, I think we have to work within this confusion and, uh, and keep pushing for making small gains. I don't know that I have any terrific suggestions, unfortunately about it. Um, I'm as frustrated as the um, person who asked the question about the parents who won't vaccinate and so forth. But I think, you know, as Erica said, you just have to embrace the frustration and keep going and doing what you know is right. And eventually, some of the information that you give falls on some ears. And, and I'll just give a quick anecdote, because I love anecdotes, because people, I don't know, they, they seem to, they respond to me, and I think they, they resonate with others. Um, I had a practice in what I sort of call the chronically overprivileged community, and I had a young lady, an adolescent, who would perpetually come back with STDs, and would not 
use any kind, you know, please wear a condom. Oh, I'm using a condom. And this was back in the days when we actually did our own wet preps. And I did a wet prep. And there would be modal sperm sitting there. So it's like, no, you're not using the condom. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can tell this. And she went on and she aged out of pediatrics. And I figured, ah, she's gone off to have a baby by now, whatever. And one day I was with, this is many years ago, I was with my small son in his stroller and we were going through the mall and I was going to buy a pair of shoes and I rolled into a Nine West store and a young lady, very well dressed, very put together young lady comes up to me and she stops and she goes, I know you. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. And she goes, no, no, I know you. And I go, well, do you have children? She goes, no, no, no children. She goes, you're Dr. Mosley. And I go, yeah, and I'm thinking, but who the heck are you? And she tells me her name, and it was the same young lady. And she said what was going through my mind right at that moment was, you probably never thought I'd amount to anything, did you? <laughs> <laughs> and I, of course, I couldn't say yes, but that was sort of like, yeah, really? So that, you know, and says, you know, you know all that stuff that you told me about respecting myself and everything? Well, eventually it stuck in and now I'm in the business management program at Wayne State University. I'm in the management trainee. I'm gonna be promoted to manager of this store and, and you know, it's just, I'm having a great life. Now, what can I get you? So, you know, who knows what, you know, I'm sure a lot of the stuff that I said fell on deaf ears, but again, there was my one starfish. It made a difference to her and so, we can't give up because we don't know where we are going to make a difference. And I'll just say one of my mentors, uh, Maxine Hayes, uh, always tells me um, when I get really uh, despondent to just uh, turn your uh, depression into dedication and keep moving forward. And I think that's just important to always remember. Thank you, Maxine, wherever you are. <laughs> there she is. Hi, uh, Dr. Mosley. Um, I think some of the references would, would be helpful. Here's, here's the reason I say that. When I go back to my institution, I'm going to get sucked right back into overwhelmed with patient care and my searches are going to be predominantly on graph versus host and things like that. So, um, but we have a lot of changes going on at our institution right now and I, around resident work hours. Um, the residents are no longer covering my transplant patients. A lot of things are changing. And that, at first that's frustrating, but now I see a lot of opportunity the way we're handling it. I think a lot of institutions are is going to a hospitalist program for the nights. And um, there's a lot of questions from our hospitalists about buy-in. Well, if you want us to follow your patients at night, retention of our hospitalists is better if they have buy-in into your service. And what I'm getting around to is that now, after hearing all of this, I see an opportunity for the buy-in to run the evening clinics, um, you know, with a little bit of Hemont coverage. I think, you know, rather than looking at the negative side of that, I think that there's a lot of, of opportunity here. Um, but when we present these plans, it's really helpful to have some of the references and other information to say this is why it's so important and this is another benefit. Yes, we can bill and we can do all of that, but here's another thing. That, so if, I don't know how easy it is to disseminate to this group, but some of the references for um, anything that you think is most important so we can be efficient in our presentation of that would be really helpful. Um, I just didn't see a lot of the references for the information in the slides. Yeah, it's hard to put the references in the slides. Right, yes, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, yeah I can, I, can I send them to you, Doug? And I don't, I don't know how, but we'll, we'll figure out a way. I think we okay. can Thanks. figure out a way. We're, we may, what we probably can do is post them on the website or something. One more question. The, um, I had kind of, a, I guess, a, a flip of the question. I, my primary clinical area is in gastroenterology and nutrition. And the, we, we're always kind of trying to address the issues of obesity, which we know kind of are proliferating across America. And I want to kind of ask a question in regards to kind of social equality as well as um, uh, um, basically dealing with kind of the, the social equality issues, but also the parental capacity issues that you're kind of addressing as well, too, with some of these policy decisions. Because not only we're we seeing the rise of obesity within, obviously, the, the lack of affluent communities, but in the affluent communities, especially up here in the Northwest when I moved up here, we're seeing kind of the proliferation of kind of the, the super organic nutritious diets and kind of the increase of lack of nutrition. So almost kind of a polarization where we're seeing obesity in the lack of affluent communities and we're seeing malnutrition in the affluent communities because of the rise of organic diets and you know crunchies, beans, and it's taking all the high, high calorie foods out of their diet because of the policies talking about good nutrition, good nutrition, and the lack of parental capacity to understand moderation rather than polar extremes. 
what are what, what are your takes on kind of like I said, it's kind of the flip side, but we kind of see both sides of this in our practice regarding social equality and such. I just have an aphorism that I heard, uh, okay, I heard it on NPR the other morning, about uh, the Italian um, healthy diet. Did you hear this? Essentially that, um, it's, you know, it's a great healthy diet from uh, Italian countryside somewhere, and um, how much healthier they used to be, and now they are the most obese um, country in Europe. And uh, the l bottom line was essentially that these days you have to be rich to eat like a peasant. And um, <laughs> But that's an interesting challenge, and that we do sometimes um, resort sometimes to extreme com comment and discussion in order to try to move what we think is a sort of an under-motivated uh, population, whether it's highly resourced or lowly resourced. Um, I think that extreme language speaks to both our lack of an inherent level of trust with the families we serve, our inability to sometimes listen really well to what kinds of challenges or concerns they really do have, and um, our desire to resort to scare tactics when the, um, when the cultural divide is greater, uh, and that could be greater across any kind of parameters. And I think that's worth thinking about. Thank you. I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> Okay, well, let's thank our panelists and speakers for the morning. 